happy to be here uh, this morning. And um, it's the first session, right? So yeah, you guys are in a good mood, right? I mean, it's morning. <laughs> It's the first time. Um, we're actually another way to frame this talk, um, which is uh, around sort of rethinking happiness. And a lot of this work um, is actually based on our research on meaning and purpose and some nascent work on humor as well. And, um, and a lot of this is done and codified in two classes I teach with Naomi Bagdonis called Rethinking Purpose and um, Humor, Serious Business. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the research. But first, does everyone have a piece of paper? Can they take a piece of paper out? Because I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and give you like 30 seconds to respond to very kind of thought-provoking questions. All right. Here's what I find. I find that if I just talk at you, you're going to think this is entertaining or interesting, but if I force you to write something down, you will have a piece of paper that you will take home and maybe show someone, and the behavior change that happens afterwards is dramatically different. All right, you got a piece of paper, right? All right, this is going to be pretty fast, but if you have any questions, just email me um, there. Also, all of this research is posted um, on my website at Stanford, so you can go and download anything, tell your grandkids, kids, whatever. All right, so what we're going to do in a fairly short period of time is go over a brief history of, of the happiness research. Uh, I'll put forth a, a, another way of rethinking our approach to happiness, uh, anchor on that new destination, which um, is, is focused on purpose and then talk about what to pack for the journey and then what to do on Monday. All right, so the happiness research has uh, long been um, well documented in um, not only academic papers, but a ton of books. Uh, there is no shortage of data and anecdote about the power of being happy, and certainly a, uh, being happy does correlate with a lot of really positive things like productivity and creativity. Um, oftentimes meaningfulness, et cetera. However, um, there's a hitch. Um, in all of this research that's teaching us the power of being happy, um, we oftentimes uh, overshoot. Uh, there's a lot of misperceptions about happiness. And the reality is, can we just, can we just take a moment and just say, it is a shit show out there right now. <laughs> Seriously, in the last month, just think about it, in the last month, we've had hurricanes, we've had earthquakes, we've had mass shootings, and the threat of violence is very real. Every morning you wake up and you think, it's, it's pretty hard to be happy. If, if happiness is our goal, how are we going to take on big challenges in life? How do we absorb what's happening in our world, and how do we actually... Uh, figure out how we want to contribute in positive ways. So what does drive happiness if our instincts aren't always aligned with what makes us happy? Uh, this, is, uh, this is some research that's pulled together from a line of different papers. And the thing that's really interesting is that oftentimes the things that we believe brings us happy, happiness don't as much as we think. So we often think religion will bring us happy. Happiness, and, and it does, but not as much as we think. Now, if you go volunteer and not just go to church, temple, synagogue, um, and you actually volunteer and help others, that actually correlates with happiness more than we think. But just going uh, and showing up doesn't as much as we think. Uh, and you've seen all of this research. Um, money over and above a certain threshold uh, doesn't... Um, matter as much as we think. It does matter, but maybe not as much as we think. What does matter are things over here on this um, right-hand side. So if you give your children anything, it would be a sense of self-esteem. That would matter more than we think. Um, dancing and social skills so that you have thriving relationships matters more than we think. Um, you know, free time isn't, you know, you got fired, so you have a lot of free time. It's the feeling that you can control your time, that matters more than we think. Um, the second um, maybe misperception and trap of happiness 
has a lot to do with this hedonic adaptation, that once we finally arrive at that promotion, that within three very short days, we're back at our base levels of happiness. So we adjust surprisingly quickly. The good news, of course, is that the things that we fear the most in life, oftentimes when they happen, don't hurt as badly or as long as we think they will. So there's both good and bad news with this. Um, the third misperception or trap of happiness has a lot to do with this idea of valuing happiness maybe too much. There can be paradoxical boomerang effects, um, which sound fun, but they can also hurt. Uh, Iris Moss and her colleagues um, do studies where they, they tell half of the subjects, you know, basically in a default condition, you don't have to do anything differently. And in another condition, they'll say, you know, Happiness is really important. Um, you should value happiness and seek it. And then they'll expose uh, the two conditions in, uh, to you know, sort of videos that normally would make you happy, puppies playing, et cetera. And the individuals in the happiness condition are significantly less happy than the individuals in the control condition. And what seems to be happening is that you know, we have these expectations that, that rise up. And if we expect to be happy and we are valuing happiness so much that um, our expectations raise, the gap between expectations and reality or performance is significant. And that drives down happiness levels. By the way, this little model, very simple model, is something that I use all of the time, like at home. I constantly burn things, take a picture of myself burning things, invite my kids to see me burning things, and then say, well, you know, I just don't cook. And their expectations of me cooking are at all time low, low levels. So if I ever cook, they are just like giddy, um, giddy with glee. So you can use this tool at home as well. Fourth, we think happiness is one thing. We think it's relatively stable. We either have it or we don't. But the meaning of happiness changes in very systematic ways over our life course and even within the day. I have research um, with Cassie McGillner and Sepp Kamvar. Uh, in one of the data sets, uh, we, we pull from the We Feel Fine data set that Sepp Kamvar and Jen Jonathan Harris um, created. And Sepp wrote an algorithm that combs the blog blogosphere for all mentions of I feel and I am feeling. And um, this single slide combines 12 million data points, global data points of blogs. Because blog-based data um, has demographics associated with it, um, we can start to understand what people are um, talking about when they blog and what they're feeling. So uh, the way to read this is we start out simple. And these are 11 to 14-year-old bloggers. And how, how many of you have uh, teenage kids? All right, so when you say, how are you feeling, they say, fine. fine. What you do today? Nothing, right? John's kind of internalized that. So there's not this big um, emotional lexicon associated with the 11 to 14 year old. Um, they don't really emote. Um, but so they soon they fill up with angst. So 15 to 18, they start to feel very anxious. When they do feel happy, it's equated to excitement. So literally, I feel happy means I feel excited. And then feelings of confinement around 20, they start to feel unknown, alone. Um, kind of empty until we leave those feelings behind to go conquer the world. At 25, they start to feel more powerful and the allure of money, power, or status starts to correlate with their happiness. Before gradually trading ambition for balance, around 30, they start to talk more about not feeling balanced or wanting to feel more balanced. Developing an appreciation for our physical bodies at 35, they start to wonder why they feel overweight or out of shape, they forgot to work out, and all of a sudden, magically, their bodies have gone downhill. And then our children, um, they're only as happy as their least happy child. An evolving sense of connectedness, for which we feel grateful, happy, calm, and blessed. And um, as some of you know, like we, we don't die at 50. It's just that the blog-based data you know, shrinks substantially, so they just <laughs> cut it off. I don't want any of us to worry. Um, but the migration path of happiness is from excitement all the way to contentment. So if a 50-year-old says, I feel happy, it means I feel content, peaceful, grateful. 
Now, it's not always linear. We can also experimentally manipulate these things so 50-year-olds can act and behave like 18-year-olds, and 18-year-olds can act and behave like 50-year-olds. Um, and so if you go into our research program, you can see all of those studies. But to summarize this, what we find is that individuals move from a mindset of discovery where the promise of happiness is excitement, and then they move into pursuit where the promise of happiness is that feeling of conquering the world. And then you move into balance where the feeling of happiness is about alignment or the opportunity to have work and health and family um, all sort of be thriving. Then you move to impact where the meaning of happiness is more aligned with feeling meaningful or a sense of significance, much more outward looking. And then you move to savoring where the meaning of happiness is equated to, as I said, contentment or peacefulness. And because people are making decisions based on optimizing their happiness, and our research is showing that the meaning of happiness is shifting and really different ways. What that means is when you are optimizing for happiness as excitement, you're making really different decisions about what beverage to drink, what car to buy, who to marry, versus if you're optimizing for contentment or balance. Um, so it has dramatic impact on the choices we make in our life. Um, so what this research shows is that we often pursue happiness, and yet once we attain it or know what it is, its meaning changes, and we start the pursuit again. So the question is, can we rethink our approach to happiness? So how might we create products, um, cultivate organizations, and live lives that cultivate happiness if we can't aim for it? Now here's where you're going to hate me just briefly. Um, I'm going to contend that it has a lot to do with destination and journey. Um, yes, new research confirms what old wise people have told us forever. Um, Rolf Waldo Emerson wrote, Life is a journey, not a destination. T.S. Eliot writes, The journey, not the destination matters. Um, Confucius, Roads were made for journey, not destinations. Um, so first, let's talk a little bit about destination or this uh, concept of a North Star. Um, so destination in our Rethinking Purpose class, when we have a whole bunch of um, students in the class, feels often very daunting or elusive. Um, when we ask individuals, what is your purpose, they'll often say, I have no clue. In fact, I'll just um, raise of hands. How many of you in this room were just born with a sense of purpose or this idea of what you were meant to do? Raise your hands. Okay, so usually it's about this. Like this is actually less for you. Normally it's about 5%. I think there was like three people. Um, and, and that's what we find, right? Like the large majority of people weren't you know, gifted with this internal sense of like, I must be a ballet you know, dancer or whatever. Um, so the question is how do we help the students um, anchor on purpose if it's so elusive? Uh, what is this thing that's deeply meaningful to you? Now, a little caveat, uh, our research shows that happiness and meaningfulness, although correlated around 0.5, and by the way, these constructs, which are both very positive things, correlate around 0.4 when you're younger, all the way to 0.8 when you're older. And so that they, they become more intertwined and you start to understand that what is deeply meaningful for you is in fact bringing you happiness, but not when you're younger. So how are they different? In um, one of our papers, um, we ask individuals, you know, to what degree do you have a happy life? To what degree do you have a meaningful life? And then we'll correlate these metrics and, um, and partial out the positive covariance. So we're just looking at people who say, you know, that they have a happy but not that meaningful life or people that have a meaningful but not that happy life. So by kind of forcing them apart, we can start to understand how they have these different mindsets. Um, a few of the biggest differences Happiness feels good and meaningful does, meaningfulness doesn't always. In fact, having this meaningful life is often quite painful and hard. Entrepreneurs have a very meaningful life. Nurses, doctors have a very meaningful life. But it's not always a happy one. 
Um, the second difference is that the individuals in the happiness sort of cell say that they really are self-focused. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll say they're self-focused. They like to give themselves gifts. Um, the meaningfulness individuals aren't. They're really anchored on others. Um, they're more likely to, to sort of feel joy when others feel joy and are much more other-oriented. Happiness feels fleeting, so they're much more focused on how they feel right now. Meaningfulness individuals are more focused on um, a lasting sense of happiness where the past and the present and the future are blended. So there are some studies that have actually manipulated happiness and meaningfulness. In one study, researchers asked half of the subjects, do one thing today that makes you happy, and in the other condition, they'll say, do one thing today to create meaning, and then they'll have individuals in both cells come back to the lab, and they'll track them over time. Higher sense of meaning and purpose correlates with higher levels of good cholesterol, healthier weight, better sleep, lower levels of cortisol. Cortisol is fine for short run bursts to get away from bears, but sustained levels of cortisol aren't good. Lower risk of cardiovascular disease and a lower risk of cognitive decay. So there's a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives that's very intuitive, especially if you're a religious person. This is not rocket science. Or if you have a, a family that uh, you feel very connected to. Again, this is very intuitive findings, but it's interesting how powerful they are. And it's also interesting that Gallup and others show that individuals at work, um, when asked, do you have a sense of meaning or purpose at work? Or do you even know what the mission of your work is, of your company? 80% will say, no, I don't. And of the 20% who say, I do, when asked, do you personally resonate with that mission, um, they will say, the large majority, 75%, say no. So even if we have a sense of meaning and purpose in our life, the, the very significant chance that we don't at work is, is actually quite real. And employees who say they derive meaning at work are three times more likely to stay, 1.4 times more engaged, and 1.7 times report higher levels of job satisfaction. So the bottom line effects of having a sense of meaning and purpose at work translate to something quite substantial. So the question is, how do you find purpose, something that is deeply meaningful to you? And I'm going to give you a, sort of a couple of different tips and also things to write down. So you have your piece of paper out, right? Everyone's handy. All right, this is, these are some things that we do that's informed by our research, and then we also do it um, with our students. So some people were born with a sense of uh, purpose, others don't, nor necessarily even want to, but the reality is it's more of a skill than we think. So first, consider whether you have a moonshot right now. So the way we'll define moonshot is, is aligned with um, the way X or Google X defines it. Uh, at Google, they created uh, moonshots. Uh, they're, um, their company called X, and their purpose there is to invent and launch moonshot technologies that make the world a radically better place. Now, whether there's a good business model for this or not is another conversation, but it's interesting to learn, actually, I think, from companies. The way they define it is there is a huge problem. They, uh, there's a radical solution, like 10 times better than we could ever dream, and a breakthrough technology. Now, a lot of these ideas translate to what we know from an individual perspective, um, what we could be doing that's much more potentially ambitious than we, we potentially are currently pursuing. Um, you know, sort of classic work suggests that if you are connected to your passion, so that provides the fuel, your unique strengths, your highest and best use, and then what the world needs, and the world needs so much right now, that's not too hard. Um, then you'll be sort of in that Venn diagram intersection more connected to your purpose or what potentially could be a moonshot. So a, a personal story, I was one of these people that, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but like, so first of all, I don't really care about marketing. So just put that out there. Um, it's unfortunate because I'm a marketing professor. Um, but uh, also don't really care about helping companies uh, which is also unfortunate because I'm in the business school. Um, 
And so, but I always wanted to be an oncologist. I wanted to make a dent in cancer. I think um, all of us have been touched by cancer in one way or another. Raise your hands if you've directly or even indirectly been touched by cancer. And it feels so real, um, even for those of us who have been lightly touched. But I was worried about being a doctor. I didn't know if I would be able to be a good mom and a great partner and a great friend. Um, and, uh, and I saw my parents be these incredible, incredible parents. And I really want, I aspired to that. And so I went and became a behavioral psychologist and, and went into marketing, which is what my dad was in. And I saw that my skill sets really lined up with what he had. And we were both very efficient and highly quantitative. We were very driven. We didn't need a boss. And we loved research. Um, so I eventually made my way and, and beca became a marketing professor. And, uh, but every Sunday, I would feel kind of empty. So I don't know, have you had these Sundays where like, you feel like weirdly depressed and you're not sure why? And um, I would have those empty Sundays, especially Sunday afternoon. And you know, fast forward, I got hired by UCLA for four years, still felt empty. Uh, came back to Stanford on Sundays, got married and had children. And um, I felt less empty, but I still had this twinge of emptiness on Sundays. And I, I think, you know, and I used to give these big talks for PhD students and whatnot and saying, Listen, let's all face it. We're, you know, we're in marketing. We're trying to teach, you know, privileged people how to make more money um, at Stanford. You know, let's not take ourselves too seriously. We're not curing cancer here, and um, and it would be kind of helpful for these PhD students because they wouldn't feel so heavy. Um, but I think that had something to do with my emptiness on Sundays. Um, Fast forward, and I think all like a lot of people I talk to have like closet careers. Like if I could quit now and like do something new, I know exactly what I would do. But for whatever reason, we went this other path, right? So um, fast forward, I went to Berkeley for a couple years, and then before coming back to Stanford, and I was teaching a creativity and innovation class there, and I asked my students, you know, to share a story of what. Um, how they changed because of the class. And one of the students shared with me a story, and the story was so impactful. And it was about his best friend who had leukemia and a process by which he harnessed social networks and story in order to get over 20, 25,000 people in the bone marrow registry in order to try and save the life of his best friend because he needed a match. And he was South Asian, so the, uh, the odds of survival were incredibly small because there is... Uh, very few matches in the in the in the registry for him, and in that process, Robert, my student, found a perfect match for Samir, his best friend, along with Robert's friends and family. And this story that he shared with me at the end of my class was so impactful that I went back that night and talked to my husband Andy, and um, and I said we should write a book about this story. It's incredible. It's about how do you harness social technology and power of story to actually make big change, even if you have no money, no resources, no anything. And he did. He quit his job. We wrote a book together. It was called The Dragonfly Effect. And it was absolutely meaningful. It was absolutely a moonshot for me and for Andy. Because um, what was interesting about it is not only were we able to write that book, but we were able to redefine success for ourselves and our family. We, um, you know, instead of defining success by how much money we made and maximizing money, because this is not a smart financial move, let me just tell you. Um, but we, but our, our real measure of success was we wanted our kids to be inspired to do massive good in the world, to be really impactful. We wanted them to be like Kennedy kids, but without the issues. Uh, so we wanted them to, you know, really just rise to that occasion, and that's really hard to inspire when I'm at Stanford all the time, Andy's at Dolby all the time, and our kids are at home. Like, they're not seeing us, and we're not going to move to Darfur because, you know, nails. I, like, I'm not going to be able to do it. Um, so how do we do good, and how do we inspire them to do good when we're not really living that life in front of them? And what the book Dragonfly allowed us to do, we spent a year working with 12 students here to try and get over 100,000 people in the bone marrow registry in order to um, give homage and, uh, to Robert and also Samir. And that was incredibly gratifying and our kids were very involved. So what was powerful about this is our metric of success changed. Instead of saying we're maximizing 
profitability or we're maximizing what we should be doing, we think we should be doing. Um, instead, we said our metric of success was that our kids would be connected to charities and doing good and uh, we would get more than 100,000 people in the bone marrow registry. So every summer now our kids create their own little businesses, find their own favorite charities, and then donate that money to those charities instead of swim team or tennis team, they actually do that. Um, and that was really exciting and inspiring for us. Now, your meaning or purpose doesn't have to be something that launches you to the moon. It could be something as simple as making a difference in just one person's life. Um, it's better to light one small candle than to curse the darkness. All right, so take 30 seconds right now, and based on that little story, just write down a couple of glimmers of moonshots or, or goals, important goals, that you might take on in the next five or 10 years. All right, the second tool that um, we talk a lot about is thinking back about the most defining stories of your life. As John mentioned, I teach also a class called The Power of Story, and what I find is this simple exercise um, is incredibly illuminating for a sense of purpose. So just write those stories down. They will inspire you and provide clarity around your North Star. So Hemingway was once known to have written the first six-word story. He wrote, baby shoes for sale, never worn. And um, so I make my students write six-word stories like, not quite, aspiring to be quite. Tonight he packs, tomorrow I pine. Married the wrong girl, fixed it. <laughs> Getting old, ringtones piss me off. So um, what I'd like you to do is write down, in 30 seconds or less, just one six-word story about your, your life. Um, and if you are good at this, keep writing more stories. I usually give everyone two minutes. I'm only giving you 30 seconds. So. Six words or less, write down um, some defining stories of your life. So the second thing I often do with my students is after they've written down all of their two minutes of six word stories, I'll ask them to go through all of the stories and pick out the through line or the common themes that keep bubbling up in each of these stories. And if you look at those through lines or those themes, it's really remarkable how much that illuminates a key part of your purpose or North Star. All right, next, let's talk about the journey. The journey concept is also unclear and esoteric. Uh, what do you actually need to pack for your journey? So uh, the things to pack, we will contend, are secret weapons. You need a tribe. Um, and you also need a way to diffuse tension, because if you're going to be playing at the top of your game, anchored on moonshots, you need a way to actually uh, diffuse tension, because it will be high stakes. It will be serious. It will be um, ambitious. So how do you cultivate these things? And we will contend that humor is the answer. If you can balance gravity with levity. Um, most think that humor is fun and frivolous. In reality, it matters a lot. It has an outsized impact on our ability to both make progress toward our destination and also to embrace the journey because it's a multiplier. And what we mean by that is it serves at least three functions, if not more. Humor is a secret weapon. Uh, here's a quote by Dick Costello um, that we like. It was a tweet. In one um, of our studies, or actually not our studies, this was um, uh, by Brad Bitterly, Allison Brooks, and uh, Maury uh, Schweitzer. Uh, what they did was they um, studied the influence of humor on status in new and existing relationships. And what they found is when people use humor successfully, which I know is an art, which is why we have an entire class on it, um, increased levels of confidence and, per, uh, and competence um, are perceived by people, and that accrues status or perceived status. So you try a joke, you land that joke, and I attribute you more confidence, competence, and also status. So uh, humor plays also a, a fundamental role in shaping relationships, and it can build your tribe. In another study, researchers uh, um, told people to write down five pieces of personal information. In one condition, uh, you guys saw a neutral film and then wrote down that personal information. In the second condition, you saw a humorous film clip and then wrote down that 
personal information, and the results suggested that in the humor condition, you self-disclosed more to uh, other individuals in the experiment, so you were more open. Um, there's a lot of research to show that oxytocin is released when people laugh. Uh, it opens people up, and trust is able to um, be cultivated. Moments of laughter spark trust and they quicken self-disclosure. It solidifies your tribe's closeness over time. It can significantly impact culture. It also diffuses tension. Uh, in another study, researchers had two conditions and they had um, a confederate say, my final offer is blank. And then another condition, the confederate said, my final offer is blank and I'll throw in my pet frog. And these researchers measured um, concessions and how that negotiation went. And what they found was in the second condition, there was 18% more concessions. And not only that, that subjects reported increased enjoyment of the task and reduced tension. Uh, Angela Merkel wrote, humor is important in politics. I laugh at least once every day, otherwise I cannot do my job. I would never allow people to take away my holiday from me. And it's a really sad state of affairs when we're quoting German Chancellor <laughs> Angela Merkel. Like, we, we're, we're in bad shape, people. We gotta like start learning from very unsuspecting forces. Now, humor is a superpower, but there is this problem. Our self-perceptions of funniness uh, plummet as we age. It turns out that we have data from Gallup, uh, and it's corroborated with experimental data as well, that we have high perceptions of how funny we are when we're kids. And we're also doing a pretty good job when we're like, you know, adolescents. And then it basically plummets at around 21, 23-ish um, when we enter the workforce. And you know, it might be because we're very important and efficient. It might be because we landed, tried to land a joke and it bombed. It might be because it's a new context and we don't know how to read the room or we don't have status. But for whatever reason, our self-perceptions of humor globally plummet. This isn't a US problem, this is a worldwide problem. And because humor and laughing is associated with health benefits, performance benefits, creativity benefits, this is a significant problem. So how do we move the needle on humor? First, know your own funny. So there's so many different types of humor, right? And this is, I mean, culturally, gender, I mean, it's, it's humor is incredibly individualistic. So really kind of getting back in touch with your sense of humor is important. I am voted the least funny person in my five-person family. Everyone is hilarious, but apparently not me. They took a vote, and that's the verdict. Um, now, and I would agree with them, I didn't vote because they do secret voting behind my back. But if I did, um, don't worry, I'm fine. Like, they're, they're, we're all very supportive of each other. Um, but when I'm in another country, I'm hilarious. I crush. I can do live stand-up. Um, now, here in the United States, when I'm at home, there is a lot to do, and we don't have any time to be funny. we got to get the show on the road. But when I travel, and then I'm good. So our family keeps traveling. We move a different country like every year for at least two to four months. Um, and even if I move to New York, I'm funny. So I'll go to New York. We went to Sydney. Uh, we just moved to Stockholm. We're looking for our next destination. So and I'm thinking Berlin, honestly. I'm going to learn from Germany right now. Um, so if anyone has any connections, just putting it out there in the world, our family is ready to move, and we will move in with you. Um, so. <laughs> Email me later if you, if, you, if you have a vote for where we should go next. All right, so really quickly, I'd like you to write down, think about the last time you really laughed. Bonus points if you were at work or were the one creating humor. What was happening? Um, just wrote, write down that last moment. And if you have extra time and that becomes easy for you, ask yourself how might you cultivate more moments like this. Um, next, find your humor tribe. Um, so for me, what, what happens, because humor is such a social emotion, 
um, it's very helpful both at work and in life to have a set of people who get you're funny or if you bomb, they'll still laugh and they won't judge you. For me, it's my bridge group. Uh, we don't play bridge, but I always wanted a bridge group. And um, I saw my mom had a bridge group and I was insanely jealous. Like all they would do is like drink and wine and laugh and not play cards. So I, fast forward like 40 years or whatever, and I finally have a bridge group of these 10 women who are hilarious and we all drink wine and not play cards. And what's interesting about that is I am actually pretty funny with them. Um, they have not done a vote, but I'm sure I'm among the top uh, in terms of humor. What's also important though, because remember the data about actually laughing um, less when you enter the workforce is have one or two people at work that is part of your humor tribe. So I mentioned to you Naomi Bagdonis um, teaches the humor class with me as well as the Rethinking Purpose class this year. And, uh, and she is hilarious. Uh, she is like SNL funny. And uh, the tweets and the videos and the pranks and the stories that are cultivated with her are game changing. And what was so interesting is in order to scale that, we need to create a larger tribe because we can't be funny all the time. We got work to do too. And um, even though we're teaching a class on humor. And so we put out um, a set of applications to be on our teaching team and we were flooded with, with people responding. And all we said was, we want to create SNL meets IDEO. And now we've got this incredible 11 person teaching team that was um, pulled from just a, a huge number of applicants. And now we can really start to scale. We move quickly. We work all of the time. Literally, this team works like 24 seven and we're having so much fun doing it and we're so productive and the quality of the work is so much higher than before. So I'd like you to write down just two or three names of individuals, ideally maybe one from your personal life and potentially one from work, um, that might be your humor tribe. These are people that you might want to invite in if, if, you, if you ever wanted to like take on a humor boot camp, for example. All right, lastly, realize that humor is a choice. It's a filter through which uh, we can view the world. Our stories define us and we get to choose the genre. In one study um, with Emily Garbinsky, uh, we asked individuals to list the stories that define their life so far, similar to what you did before, and then we asked them to rate whether they were dramas, comedies, tragedies, etc. And, and then we took a whole host of other measures like self-perceptions on, on creativity, performance, success, etc. If the stories were disproportionately self-rated as tragedies, you might imagine, participants also, it was a correlational study, but it was still um, a large effect size, uh, they reported to be more anxious, stressed, sad, disappointed, feeling lonely or alone. If they also reported their stories to be disproportionately dramas, actually the same effect happened. But when they self-reported their, their stories to be comedies, they not only felt happier and more satisfied, but energetic, fulfilled, inspired, and challenged in life. Not only that, but they also said their life was more meaningful. So it wasn't just happy, but it was meaningful, that upper right-hand quadrant of the, of the categories I discussed before. So what I'd like you to do is just take a second and look back at the story that you wrote earlier and see if it wasn't already a comedy, could you actually rewrite it as a comedy? All right, so Mel Brooks once said, comedy abounds if you just look around you. Uh, and if you do, you will all have a new superpower. So in sum, uh, know that happiness is miserable, or at least chasing it is. Uh, real success comes down to anchoring on the right destination and embracing the journey. You need a compass to navigate the destination and you need to know what to pack for the journey. So capture the journey in stories, but also realize you get to pick the genre. Uh, Bill Murray once said, if you can stay light and stay loose and stay relaxed, you can play at the very highest level as a baseball player or a human being. And this was shared when he actually gave a speech to a bunch of baseball players, and he ended the speech with a perfect bit of zen. Stay at it, but stay light. Don't be afraid to do what comes naturally. Fight the urge to be serious. Don't let it destroy the very thing that makes you. 
And the, and the guy who wrote this was George Saunders, and he, he has a picture of Bill Murray in his office um, just to remind himself to stay at it but stay light. So I encourage you to think about who your humor hero is or what picture you might put on the wall to remind you how to balance the gravity with the levity. You're only given a little spark of madness. You mustn't lose it. And the question that I think is so interesting is how will you keep the pilot light on? Thank you. I'm gonna do one more thing. Um, so, all right, so Naomi and I are thinking like, what are we gonna do to sort of make sure all of this content doesn't just stay at Stanford, um, but actually could be um, sort of unlocked, so to speak. And so what we're putting together right now, this week our teaching team is gonna um, beta test it. But what we're putting together is like a one week humor boot camp, and it's free and if you wanna come, um, we're, you guys are a part of the party. We'd love you to, to, to participate. And so what we're trying to do is create a little gift for you, so to speak, which is a set of like maybe the most interesting and fun uh, humor covert spy missions that you could actually take on. So if you want to participate and play with us in um, sort of an online experience where we would just kind of email you and, and work with you online, you are very invited to come. All you have to do is... Um, come to our website, Humor Serious Business, and sign up for the boot camp. Uh, we'll probably have it going in about a month. And we encourage you to, to find a friend or two to do this with, because what we find is when you do it with your family or like just one other person at work, it has disproportionately better um, effects. So um, please join us if you'd like to. You can take a picture of that. And um, here's a bunch of the books that also were infused in this last part of the talk. So if you're interested in that, Dragonfly is the least funny book um, that exists. Uh, we put it with all the funny stuff because, you know, framing. And then uh, also Elements of Style isn't necessarily funny, but we just love it. So everything else, very useful and funny. All right, that's it. Thank you.